Hello everybody, my name is Maurice Button. I'm the CEO of City and Financial Global and it's my pleasure to be interviewing Dr. Helen Crowley, partner at Pollination, uh, this afternoon. Helen has kindly agreed to give a keynote address at the Biodiversity and Nature Market Summit, which is being held at America Square London on the 22nd of May. Uh, Helen, welcome. Thank you, Maurice. Great to be here. It's very nice to have you with us. Let, let's turn to the questions, if we may. Uh, my first question, uh, biodiversity loss appears to have accelerated up the political and corporate agenda very quickly uh, in recent years. Well, why do you think that is? Well, let me first say, as a biodiversity specialist and an ecologist, I'm very excited that it has. And I think there's probably three main reasons, and there are probably many, many different sort of drivers that have got us to where we are now with this incredible awakening around biodiversity, mm. but there are probably three main points. One is I think that the climate community over the last two or three, four years have really recognized in a sort of fundamental way that nature is part of the solutions to climate. You know, nature-based solutions, um, the scientific community have said that represents nearly 40% of the solution. There's technological solutions to decarbonize, but they're also nature-based solutions. So I think that was a big piece. I think the second mm. piece was there was a recognition of the, the actual, the sort of the, horrendous level of loss that we've had we are currently experiencing of biodiversity of species of ecosystems and ecosystem services and i think in 2019 with the intergovernmental panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services so the ipbs equivalent ipcc report came out and it really elaborated very carefully and clearly the level of loss that we're experiencing that really hit home mm -hmm. um, for many and then along with that came out very soon after i think the world economic report on the risk the value that is to us as a society and to business and our economy mm -hmm. But also, the, and the risk that's associated with that loss, so that 44 yeah. trillion global GDP, half it, half of the global GDP is moderately or highly dependent on nature, really sort of hit home. And then the Das Gupta report that said our whole economy yeah. is embedded in nature. So I think those sort of things came together where people were, well, we need to pay attention and we need to understand this more. Mm. No, absolutely. I fully agree with that analysis. I, Obviously, for companies, uh, you know, they're currently working hard on their uh, climate plans uh, and net zero plans, uh, but they seem to find it, do you think, slightly harder to get their minds around how they address biodiversity loss and you know, the impact of their operations on biodiversity loss and how to, how to reverse that? You know, what, what do you think the specific issues are that they face? Yeah, it's um, it's a good question. I think you're absolutely right. It's more challenging in some ways than climate. I mean, and I think there's a couple of reasons. There are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is that I think people are got used to are, are educated and understand climate and greenhouse gas emissions. But that remember that's taken quite a few years to get to that yes. point. And people are just starting to understand, well, what is biodiversity? What is the intersection of biodiversity with my business? Where does my business touch nature? Mm. What does that even mean? So I think there's a sort of an mm. understanding, trying to get their heads around what that actually means for them. And that is linked to the second point, which is a lot of the, like we're finding with climate, a lot of the biodiversity impacts and nature impacts are beyond immediate operations for many companies in what we would call it scope three in supply chains. Yes. Yep, and often yep. they don't have a lot of visibility on that part of their business and they're going to, they're starting to have to have that visibility and i think the third piece again that is important is you need that visibility you need to understand where biodiversity touches your business you need to understand your supply chains and the extent of your business to do that because biodiversity is locally relevant and important. It's not like a, a molecule of CO2 that circulates the world and is the same yeah. anywhere in the world. Biodiversity varies between locations. So understanding mm -hmm. The relevance of biodiversity in one part of your operations geographically might be different to understanding biodiversity in another part so there is an inbuilt sort of complexity but let me just say yeah. before i finish on this we should not be scared of that complexity because we can figure it out and we'll probably get to this later but also there's an incredible upside it's like once you understand those pieces then the upside mm. is understanding how you can create value 
through addressing that. And you yeah, really yeah. can do a resilience and business value through addressing that. So mm. the upside is a big upside once you step through understanding that where biodiversity intersects with your business. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. There, there is there's sort of a nature positive case for it as well, mm -hmm. isn't there? Can improve mm -hmm. returns. But looking at um, investment managers, how can uh, biodiversity be integrated into the investment process to identify and manage risks? Right. So it's a bit, it, it's sort of similar in the principles that we just talked about, sort of for corporate yeah. supply chains. In the, I mean, the very first step is understanding where across a portfolio and across your current investment um, portfolio or current in scope of investment, you yeah. might have a really important impact and or dependency on nature. So if you're investing in agriculture or forestry or fisheries, obviously you really depend on a functioning nature and functioning biodiversity. In fact, you depend on biodiversity for your revenues. If you're in infrastructure, you might be having an impact on, on nature and biodiversity. And so uh, because of the way you source your materials and where you build your infrastructure. So I think for each, so investors need to sort of start getting an understanding of across their portfolio and their asset classes, where are those uh, risks of impact and dependency, therefore where are the opportunities? And there are tools yeah. and approaches now to do that. And then I would say they need to sort of dive down into different assets and asset classes to think, okay, let's unpack that. What can we do? What yeah. do we do differently? That means that we mitigate this risk, but we create value. And so sort of going yeah. a deep dive. I think when it comes to sort of um, investment life cycle, I think up front there's sort of a you, there's starting to be a new way of thinking of how do I look at risk and and return mm. profiles? How do I understand that given the situation with with nature more broadly and what I need out mm. of my investment? So I think there's some thinking up front also about when you first go into an investment, am I actually looking at the things I need to look at to really understand the risk and return portfolio? And should I be building in, just like with climate risk scenarios, should I be building in nature risk scenarios? So there's some different areas that uh, I think they could, you can get started on pretty quickly. Yeah, and I guess both for large companies, at least here in the UK, and for financial institutions, that their approach to this is governed by regulation. You know, the regulators are beginning to consider, as they have done with climate change, uh, how they might approach biodiversity. So uh, that, that presumably influences the nature of the frameworks they use, the analytical frameworks for assessing that biodiversity risk and impact. And, and yeah. how, how, how do you think that's going to play out? Do you think the regulators will manage to encapsulate it properly? Oh, there's there's a lot in that question. <laughs> so first, yeah, well, there is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely the reg. I mean, we all know that regulation is a real driver, and the anticipation of new regulation coming through is a driver for yeah. change. I think this coming out of the global biodiversity uh, framework, the new framework that's come out of the the Convention on Biological Diversity in December that was held in Montreal. Mm. The COP, there is a there's an explicit target in there that you know over 190 countries have agreed to about mandatory yeah. about disclosure. Sorry, it's not saying mandatory disclosure of nature risks mm. and dependencies. Mm. And I think you're seeing that starting to play out already in different jurisdictions about how companies are going to be regulated and what they disclose. In the UK, you know, in transition plans, they have to articulate yeah. their nature and climate. Um, commitments and 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 uh, risk portfolio risk profiles. Mm. I'm sorry. So I think you're starting to see this really um, coming out there as a driver for change and as a as a way that is really people are saying, okay, not only regulation coming, but I need to understand that because of the regulation, but because of of my business and the future of my yes. business as well. So I think no. the question of will regulation get it right? I think the frameworks that we're building together these multi-stakeholder initiatives like the task force for nature related mm. financial disclosure that is is working with policy as well and policy is looking to that framework what's happening with that framework i think there is starting to be coherence that means we really probably will um, get close to sort of having a uh, on the right path so that policy drives 
the direction of travel in the right direction, you know, along with the voluntary commitments that mm. companies and investors are making. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds positive. But I guess you know, one of the biggest challenges is, is getting the right data uh, and, and being able to amalgamate data from different sources and make informed decisions uh, about that. Uh, do, do you, how, what, are, what are your thoughts on that, about the availability of data uh, and the validation of that data, the integration of it and taking decisions on it? Do you think there are good enough sources now? Yeah, it's it comes up every time I give a presentation or in workshops or with many of the many of my clients is the data issue. And here's is in a in a nutshell, I would say we have a lot of data around what's happening mm. to biodiversity, what's happening to nature. It is not currently packaged in the appropriate decision ready uh, way for every single sort of sector in the private sector, right? It is yeah. packaged in certain ways. So our challenge is to repackage a lot of that science, scientific data. And this is happening all over into ways that can be then used by investors and by corporates and by governments to actually understand not only what decision to make and what priority to take mm. around nature, because there's a lot of different uh, points that business interfaces with nature but what's the priority action not only that but also to track change over time and there's some really interesting yes. technologies that are coming out mm. that, that are going to help so i think the question here is yes there's a about the data it, there is data it needs to be packaged it is starting to get packaged appropriately but the other point i want to make is we should not be paralyzed by that point by mm. the fact it's not quite right or ready because we know where we need to be going we know we need to stop conversion of natural systems we know we need to stem pollution we know we need to do these the deal mm. with climate because that affects nature as well so i think there's certain um no regrets actions and yes. targets can start putting in place as the data and the sort of appropriateness of the data and the methodology uh, matures so that it can be more mm. targeted to different audiences. And Fantastic. Needs. Well, thank you very much. I wish I had more time, Helen, but I, I think that that's our allocated time for this interview. Very much looking forward to meeting you in person. Uh, once again, the uh, Biodiversity and Nature Market Summit is happening at the America Square Conference Center in London on the 22nd of May. I very much hope that uh, our viewers can join us in person at that event. Only remains to, for me to say, Helen, thank you very much for sharing those insights. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you all at the conference. Thank you so much.